you are. I asked Michael and Lindsay how they wanted to be introduced. And Michael said that I could just say that they are two awesome people. And in fact, they are. And they have awesome kids. And in addition to being very active, engaged parents with us at the JLC, um, they are a theater family. Uh, Lindsay is the general manager of the Manhattan Theater, um, just having been promoted to that title, which is Mazel Tov. And Michael is the managing director of WP, which is Women's oh, Project. Project. And uh, I went to one of the shows, and it was amazing to, to watch this production written by a woman and done by women. So um, without further ado, I will stop talking and turn it over to you to tell us about the state of the theater, what's going on, what your aspirations are, and a little bit about how you got to the theater, other than the subway. Why don't you start? Um, okay. So my, hi everyone, good evening. My story is like um, so many theater administrators um, that we know. I uh, grew up loving theater. I was a performer when I was a child. Um, I, you know, took voice lessons and dance classes. And um, my parents, I, I grew up in Springfield, not too far from here. And I was lucky enough to go to Broadway plays uh, all the time and musicals. Um, from the time I was very young. And I was very passionate about acting. I went to uh, college for performance. Um, and while I was in school, I had a professor who said, if you're not going to um, be auditioning when you graduate right away, you should try to get a job in theater rather than wait tables, you know, try to learn about the business. Um, and I took that to heart. And so after, College, I got an internship at Manhattan Theater Club um, huh. and uh, in the general management office. I didn't really know much about the business at all. I had taken one theater management class during college, um, but I had stage managed a little bit. Um, and so I liked, you know, actors really don't have any, uh, they don't have much authority or power in the room, but there are other people who do, like general managers and stage managers and um, I, uh, I got an internship at MTC. Um, I clicked with the, uh, one of my mentors, the general manager at the time, Harold Wolpert. That's the first time I heard Toby Stein's name. Um, uh, she and Harold go back a long way. And, um, it just sort of stuck for me. I didn't really miss performing very much. Um, I would never give up my acting training for everything, the, for anything, I should say, the discipline of it. Um, I think that I can speak well to a crowd and that carries over into my job, which we can talk about a little bit later. Um, but I just fell in love with, uh, helping to build the, the plays that we present on our stages. Um, general managers, uh, do the contracts for all the people that you see, um, when you go to the theater. And, um, and yes, exactly. Um, you know, we get the the rights to the play, the deal with the director, the designers, the actors. Um, we do deals with the various um, backstage unions, um, so we can have stagehands and wardrobe personnel and ushers and box office treasurers and all of that. Um, general managers uh, troubleshoot things that come up along the way, various personnel issues that might arise figuring out what to do when you're shut down because of a pandemic. Um, we'll get into all of that. But I started off as an intern at MTC. I became the general management assistant. I did that for a couple of years. Um, and then I became the company manager, uh, who at, at least at Manhattan Theater Club is the person who does all of the actor and stage manager contracts and really takes care of the company. If somebody's coming in from out of town, um, I would arrange their travel and their apartment accommodations, um, take them to the emergency room if somebody gets 
sick and not just the actors. I mean, anybody involved in the show, crew members, designers, all of that. Um, that was a really grueling schedule. I was in the office all day long and at the theater um, on a show schedule. So um, that was hard. So when the associate general manager position opened up, um, this was right around the time we got married. Um, I said, yes, I want that job. That seems a little more my pace. Um, and uh, so I was the associate to the general manager for many years. Um, and then eventually I took over as the general manager for our off-Broadway theaters. And when my um, boss left recently to go work at the Yale Repertory Theater, um, I became the general manager of the whole mishpucha. Um, Which in total has been how many years? I've been there for 20 years. Wow. Um, so uh, when I speak, I am only talking about the Manhattan Theater Club because I have no other experience. <laughs> um, but MTC has been a great place for me. Um, for those of you who aren't as familiar, we're a not-for-profit organization. We produce eight plays a season, three on Broadway at the Samuel J. Friedman Theater, and five off-Broadway three in our 300 seat stage one theater and two in our 150 seat stage two theater. Um, although that will change this season, um, which we will get into in just a moment, but that's how I came to be where I am. Oh, and we moved to the suburbs and had three kids along the way and <laughs> that too. What about you, Michael? Uh, I think <laughs> story is virtually the opposite of hers. Uh, I've worked in- Closer, Michael. Sorry, closer? Yeah, to the mic. I've worked in a multitude of offices um, in Manhattan and outside of the city. I began, similar to Lindsay, I was an acting student uh, at school and explored a business job once I'd moved up to the city. I began working for a personal manager, which is someone that coaches and tries to find job opportunities for actors in film, television, and live theater. That was short-lived and maybe the worst job of my entire life. Welcome to New York City. And then I moved, I, I worked for about two years at uh, the Actors' Equity Association, which is the union that represents um, uh, the actors in the professional live stage across uh, America, uh, the United States. After that, I moved into commercial theater, which uh, an office that was producing very large Broadway musicals. And I was there for about four years and they expanded their business operations to um, China and offered me a position running an office that they had opened in Shanghai. So I moved to Shanghai uh, about three weeks after we got married, actually, uh, I moved to Shanghai and lived there and sort of bounced around uh, all of Asia for two years, two and a half years, uh, producing musical theater and, um, I don't know, the being, being the fixer. They would call me up in the middle of the night and they'd say, we've booked you on an, air on an airplane at 7 a.m. You have to fly to Manila right away. There's an emergency and you're going to have a meeting at noon and tell us when it's all figured out. And then I would go and do all the things and then I would call them uh, at, at 10 o'clock my time and try to catch them all up in a room. And there was 17 people in a conference room in New York City and me in my hotel room, wherever they had sent me the night before, talking about crises and how to move, take the next step. It was an exciting phase. I moved back to the States and worked in a commercial general management office for about six and a half years. Uh, opening about 50 productions on Broadway. I was an associate general manager. I did most of the same contracts that Lindsay did, but on the commercial side instead of the not-for-profit side. Uh, and then after that, I left there after six and a half years, and I was the general manager at the Williamstown Theater Festival for about a year and a half, and then left that job to become the managing director at WP Theater about almost four years ago uh, and then and then there's now and that's the intro and tell us about now <laughs> now is I, I, you, 
you must be able to imagine it is a very difficult period of time. Um, I, I speak from the perspective of a small not-for-profit. Our annual budget is about $2 million. Lindsay's is, I think, about $30 million. So big, big not-for-profit, small not-for-profit. And I think for both of us, it's tremendously difficult. Uh, we are small, so have managed not to lay anyone off yet. But the pressure is on about reducing costs and cutting wherever you can because there is no more programming. There's no more live theater. Uh, and a colleague of mine uh, yesterday said, if you, if you had to say it off the cuff, when do you think you would be producing a live show again? And I believe that it's September of 2021 is when we'll actually be able to open our doors and put audiences in the theater. And I, I John Lasseter, I know it's, it's upsetting, um, but I don't, they don't have any answers for indoor activities right now. They keep pushing it back and saying, we don't know enough about it yet. What they're figuring out from my perspective, what they're figuring out is step-by-step -step processes to do everything but inside um, collection. And that, remains to be seen. The air circulation is a huge issue, uh, touching all the same surfaces, being near the actors, especially when they're singing, uh, the projection of an actor's voice essentially um, extends viral transmission to the back of the theater. That's what we're taught from a very young age. Speak as if the people in the back of the auditorium need to hear exactly what you're saying all the time. Uh, so while that is complicated and a little bit depressing, the reality is that's the timeline we've been talking about a lot recently. Um, yeah, we are not this. It has been um, a surreal uh, handful of months, as it has for everybody in different ways. Um, you know, the first part of the lockdown was um, it was sort of fast and furious as we were you know, figuring out how to be at home and protect ourselves and our family and get the kids up to speed with remote schooling. We were, we had a show that was about to begin its tech perform, uh, tech rehearsals and then performances on Broadway. We were meant to do Paula Vogel's um, Pulitzer Prize winning play, How I Learned to Drive with Mary Louise Parker and David Morse. Um, and, you know, it was very, touch and go for the first, you know, at first it was like, we're gonna take a pause. I think everybody thought this, we're gonna, you know, lock down for, for two weeks. Um, we're going to suspend rehearsals and then we will, you know, Broadway had shut down by that point performances, but they hadn't said we couldn't continue to rehearse. Um, and everyone sort of thought, okay, we'll get to, you know, this new date in mid April and we will be able to resume again. So, you know, we weren't like trying to jerk anyone around. We, we really didn't know. So those initial conversations were like, we're having, we're gonna take a pause, stop what you're doing. Everyone take care of yourselves, be safe. We'll see you back here in a couple of weeks. We'll resume rehearsals. We'll get up into tech. I had shows that were meant to start rehearsal, I think maybe the second and third weeks of April off Broadway. So I was making calls to those artists about you know, just hang tight. We we are still really hopeful that we can do this. Um, you know, don't get on an airplane to come here yet, but stay tuned. And then it just sort of, I mean, it felt like it happened in an instant, but at the moment it was like molasses. Um, and then as we approached, you know, we got into the beginning of April and it started to become very clear that uh, we wouldn't be able to perform anytime soon. And so, you know, calls to those same artists, not just the actors, but the director, um, the, the designers, the production assistants, the stage managers, all of the crew. Um, and it was really, you know, just like so many people have experienced in various industries. I mean, just heartbreaking, you know, um, telling these artists who rely on us for their employment, their health insurance, that we wouldn't be able to employ them. Um, and, you know, no fault of our own. We didn't, it's a, it's a force majeure. It's a, a real crisis. Um, so, you know, those early days were really spent 
uh, troubleshooting, talking to the artists. Um, I dreaded every phone call I had to make, but ultimately felt good after it because having those human connection moments, um, I think, helped me as much as the artists. You know, uh, I, I pat myself on the back because um, when I called a number of these people, you know, and I said, I don't want you to read it in the newspaper that we're not going on. They said, well, you know, thanks for that because we're not getting phone calls from everybody. And, you know, I, every company has got to do their own thing, but um, we don't do everything right at MTC, but we really do try to take care of our, um, the artists and the crew. And um, you have to, you know, it's just about being human. Um, and so, you know, we kind of, night buddy, um, we ultimately, you know, canceled all of our spring shows. Um, and then the work started to change a little bit. You know, we had to uh, clean up deals with some of the unions. You know, the way that we close a show typically with the actors, with the stagehands, we give people a certain amount of notice. And in this situation, we weren't able to give everyone notice. But again, it wasn't. Um, you know, we weren't pulling the rug out from under these productions. Um, COVID-19 was. And so we had to do a lot of um, bargaining with our various union partners to come to agreements about what those deals would be that, you know, MTC is about to, you know, have real financial crisis, but so are all the individuals that we employ. And so, you know, just as we always do um, with collective bargaining, if I'm using vocabulary that you guys don't understand, um, you know, make notes, and when we get to the Q and A, ask, and we'll we'll go back. Um, but uh, you know, so we we're making all of those deals, and then the work sort of my, our our work. Um, I don't need to speak for Michael. My work, um, you know, kind of pivoted again. We start to think about. Uh, you know, it's going to be a good long time now, we understand, until we can really be back in our theaters. Um, Broadway is still aiming for the middle of March. I really have no idea if that's realistic. If you talk to, I mean, okay, so there's a lot of stuff that we have to figure out before we can get back in the theater. We've got to make sure our administrative staff can get back to the offices safely. We need to figure out how the crew can be safe, the actors can be safe, they're sharing dressing rooms, you know, just by a show of hands, when will you guys go back to the theater? Is it when there's a vaccine? Yeah, I see head nodding. I mean, would you go back tomorrow if they said, come to our theater and wear a mask? No, nobody's gonna do that. So even- <laughs> It's not very positive. I know, I'm just, I'm, you know, because there are there's all the stuff we have to work out on stage and backstage but if nobody was going to come and see us and buy the tickets right we still can't open so it's a real we had this conversation puzzle. in my office uh as we were getting knee deep in the process and, and the understanding that the reopening of the theater was going to be a really long process i spent two hours on the phone with my production manager and my business manager talking through the process of what it would look like for a patron to come to the theater, watch a show and leave the theater. And at the end of the two hours, we all threw our hands up in the air and we're like, who in the world wants this experience? Who wants to like get a test when you go into the theater door, wash your hands before you touch the elevator, wash the elevator after every single patron goes up one at a time into the theater space. Uh, wash everything that anybody may have touched while they're in the theater. It just, the complexity rolls on and on. And so now I'm on an off-Broadway task force that talks every week for a couple hours about what reopening our theaters look like. And we've all sort of, while we keep talking and keep exploring, the reality is theater is going to take its lead from a lot of other large institution operations. Like sports, I think, are aggressively pursuing ways to get people into stadiums. And getting people into stadiums, especially when they're open air stadiums, is gonna happen probably before you can put 2,000 people in a large theater complex. They're gonna figure solutions out for touching surfaces and what people have to wear and how distant they have to be. 
Um, I'll give you a little piece of perspective. When in my in my office task force, we spoke about what the theater would look like if we had socially distanced seating. Our theater holds 108 people, and we could fit 17 people in with a six foot radius around each one of them. More if people book tickets as a group and say the eight of us are coming together, the eight of us are all comfortable sitting next to each other. But you begin the process of actually navigating how 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 can I use this box of seats every night to fit the most amount of folks in? And the reality is, which if you're if you're paying any attention to what the the Broadway group is saying, the economics of com certainly of commercial theater and mostly of, of not-for-profit theater, they don't work at less than 100% capacity. Charlotte St. Martin, who's the president of the Broadway League, after she was had her wrist smacked by Andy Cuomo for suggesting that we might open the theater uh, at any given point, um, she said, listen, the reality is the business model for live theater doesn't allow for less than a 100% return of capacity. Not only that, but the backstage, I mean, the theaters were built 150 years ago. The backstage conditions, the dressing rooms are incredibly cramped. You know, I've, I've been backstage at a Broadway show and you sort of see a crew member in all blacks huddled in the corner so that other people can walk past them. The, yeah. the conditions are really, really tight and it's impossible to socially distance uh, while creating the same work that's been on the Broadway stage for the last few years. Um, perhaps there's new inventive ways of making work. Certainly there's conversations about solo shows or a show where one actor is on stage right and one actor is on stage left and they talk to each other but never engage with each other. But again, the question has to be asked, who actually wants to pay to go see that work? Is that the work that people actually want to consume at this moment or when they get the ability to? Uh, and that leads you to a conversation of how do you provide alternative types of entertainment, such as digital programming uh, in the live theater space. And is that something that people want? You know, the, the instinct, the immediate instinct of a lot of my peer theaters, the small off-Broadway theater community, was to dig back into their archives, find footage from some of their most popular shows, and share it for donations online, which is something that the union structure allows you to do. Uh, the reality is those recordings, for those who know how theatrical archival recordings are made, they're often made with a single camera <laughs> in a back corner of the theater without zooming or panning or going anywhere. Beyond that, many, many companies make something that's a little fancier than that, but the mo most of the small Broadway community um, lives with this one archival recording and the intent of making that B-roll recording is to get 30 seconds of advertising. So you can tape a two hour show, splice together 30 seconds of material, and that's what you use for your television ads or for your lobby reel uh, or what have you. So the experience that a lot of theater companies had that rushed to broadcast archival material uh, is that A, it cost much more to actually make it viewable and to by the platform and to advertise it than those productions were bringing in. And even the patrons of those theater companies who were excited about this digital engagement after watching it a couple times said, you know, I don't wanna watch that anymore. I have, there's, I have Netflix um, and, and I can find things that are made much nicer than what it is when you broadcast an archival, single camera, poor audio recording of a show. And just to add one more piece to the puzzle, if any of you saw Hamilton on Disney Plus, I, my understanding, and I didn't work on it, but my understanding is they spent $10 million recording that between paying the artists and doing multi cameras and doing multi additional performances, both in front of and, and without an audience to get the end result. That is not something that any of the other theaters can afford to do. Not even the Broadway theaters who often capitalize a musical at 15 or $20 million. That extra $10 million only can happen when you have a mega hit. And the only show that's done it in the last chunk of years is Hamilton, at least to that degree. Uh, there are other companies that are making digital recordings like Broadway HD and 
Broadway direct. Now I'm making up names because I think that they're out there. <laughs> the reality is it's very expensive and you often, often don't get the viewership from a digital program like you do from a live, live version. Um, we are though. So the other folks in my office, um, you know, we have a team of Manhattan theater club is a very, um, big, uh, company. You know, we've got 60 something full-time staff members, not including all the show specific union folks we employ. Um, so we have a, a whole, you know, department of the people who choose the plays and produce the plays and cast the plays. And, um, they together with the folks in our marketing office, um, and some others are like, they've be become the digital task force. So while, uh, some of us are figuring out how we reopen the offices and the theaters and the kinds of task force. I mean, we have all the same task forces that Michael's doing too in our organization with colleagues outside the organization. Um, you know, uh, we're trying to figure out how to keep our um, various constituencies engaged and, you know, make sure that people remember Manhattan Theater Club. Um, there's a weekly email that goes out, um, our education office um, solicited in the very, they reacted immediately. Um, uh, they solicited education, okay. the education department. Um, they uh, solicited monologues inspired by the phrase, there's something I need to tell you. Um, you know, we have many programs at Manhattan Theater Club. I won't take the time now to go into them, but we, we have a really robust education program. We go out to schools, they come to us. We have distance learning, that kind of thing. Um, and so we reached out and asked students to submit these monologues. They did, they were fantastic. We have now since engaged professional actors to um, perform these monologues. There's a new one every Thursday. So like that kind of thing where we are reaching in and reaching out to figure out how we can use um, our resources and what we do well to keep our audiences engaged. We are looking at some digital uh, content. Um, we are not interested, at least not today, in streaming a past production of the Manhattan Theater Club. Um, you know, we think that, like for all the reasons Michael said, the way they are shot are not for public viewing. Um, we, we shoot with like a single camera, maybe sometimes to, to create what we call B-roll, which is used in, you know, television commercials, website teasers, that kind of thing, promotional material. Um, we don't really do a proper archival recording of any of our shows. Um, if we are so lucky that the um, theater on film and tape archive at Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts wants to record our show for the archive, that's great. But that's under lock and key at the archive. We cannot access it. Um, you have to be a member to view these things. And, you know, I had a conversation with the guy who runs the program over there to say, you know, can we get permission from all the various unions to try to stream this stuff? Um, and he said, no way, no how, not even if you're willing to pay all of the artists and craftspeople involved. Um, but we are thinking about doing something new. Um, I can't tell you what the idea is, but I think we will probably commission some playwrights to write entirely new material that is made for now um, to be presented digitally. Um, Isn't that just television? Well, maybe. <laughs> but Michael, I don't think everybody heard your comment. <laughs> I said, Isn't that just television? I mean, if you're writing content to be recorded behind a camera, that feels like the film and TV industry. And honestly, uh, the direction that many of us are being pushed in is how do you make film and television content out of with together with live theater artists, uh, and it is very challenging. None of none of us know how to do it and what to do. But we do know that we need to figure out ways to keep up with the Joneses. You know, all of our competitors, uh, they are competitors. You know, we all have a lot of the same audience. Um, 
there you, we've got to make sure we don't get lost in the shuffle we need to figure out ways to stand out and so I don't know if it'll work um, it is not my purview to figure out if it's something we should be doing artistically it will be my purview to figure out how we contract and pay all of these artists um, I mean seriously like we won't be dealing with Actors Equity Association because they represent live live actors on the stage I will have to engage with SAG-AFTRA exactly um, and you know, same holds true for the director and we'll probably need, I mean, I don't even know the right terminology. We'll need like a director, director of photography. Of photography. Yep. Is that the right thing? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we might need, uh, you know, perhaps we will engage with a lighting designer, um, to, to help deliver, you know, a kit to each actor's home with the right kind of light and maybe microphones. I mean, I don't know. We're, we're exploring all of this. It's actually the thing that I like um, the best out of what we're doing right now because it's, it's like adjacent to what we do on a regular basis. You know, it's actually trying to make theater rather than have conversations about pandemics and PPE. Um, and the other thing, I, th I mean, I feel like we also need to tell them what's going on Broadly, even though this is about the pandemic, I don't know what you're alluding to. I'm excited to hear it. You're not okay. So, oh, racism. Racism. Oh yes, racism. So, <laughs> in addition to just trying to keep our businesses afloat through a pandemic, um, you you may or may not be aware, but um, the American theater, particularly in New York, is a terrible contributor to the systemic racism in our country. Um, if you think back to how I described how I got into the theater, it's like kind of right there, you know? I was in dance classes and voice lessons and my mother schlepped me around so I could be in plays and we went to see Broadway and then I went to college and I got a degree in acting. I mean, talk about privilege. And uh, I'm not ashamed about it, I'm, you know, I worked really hard to get where I am, but certainly my circumstances allowed for me to have that trajectory. Um, and when George Floyd was murdered, um, the, the call from the minority people, the BIPOC folks in our community was really loud that theater, needs to speak out um and it was it was really kind of wild um you know we are not political organizations we are not social justice organizations but well, is. well michael is um uh, but you know we are liberal equality seeking um people whose work it is to shine light on society, reflect life on the stage. I mean, that's what art is. And like I said, the call from our various, you know, other administrators, artists, um, to speak out about the injustices in our country was was very loud. And it and it is ongoing. Um, and since that, you know, so a lot of theater companies. You look up my company, Michaels, any of the companies that you know. Um, there's a big statement on their website right now about how Black Lives Matter, um, how they will not stand for um, racial injustice, and there's probably a set of, um, you know, uh, help me out. Um, statements. Statements, um, pledges about, you know, moving forward to create a more equitable work environment. Um, and we've hit, you know, just like I'm sure other industries as well. I know, I don't know if any of you have seen what's happened with all like the private schools in the area on their Instagram accounts. Um, black folks aren't going to take it anymore. Um, there have been testimonials about out and out racism, um, a lot of microaggressions that people have experienced working, you know, on Broadway, off Broadway in the regions. And, um, there's demands for action and a changing of the tide. You know, at Manhattan Theater Club, like I said, we're a, what, $28 million organization. There are 12 departments and 12 leaders of those departments. 
all white people. Um, our artistic staff that I mentioned earlier, that's a dozen people. They're all white. So they guess, so guess what they see. choose to mm -hmm. put on the stage? Plays that are written by white folks, directed by white folks, basically for white folks. I'm sorry that I, I'm, I know I'm starting to sound preachy, but uh, so concurrently, we are trying to solve how to reopen our theaters in a terrible financial crisis, not knowing when this will end, and also really taking a hard look at ourselves um, as individuals, as professionals in the industry to see how we can try to change the tide. And it's not easy. Um, and, you know, our different bosses are at different, you know, Michael, can I say your age? Sure. Is a, I don't know how old, old you are. I don't know. 43 year old man leading, you know, a really uh, progressive company. You know, already they only produce plays written and directed by women, um, but they hire lots of artists of color and craftspeople, et cetera. Um, because the people at the helm, I mean, they're of a different generation, frankly, of my bosses, for example. Um, and uh, it's, you know, just like I'm sure you're all having various conversations with different generations in your families. People have different points of view, the way we were raised. Um, I mean, it's a problem in America. So it's been, so when you ask, you know, when, when, the, when the prompt was like, and what are you doing now? It's like, well, we have a lot of conversations, seminars, and task forces about pandemics and racism and how to solve both of these gargantuan problems. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, the questions that were asked, I think we've gotten beyond them, actually. Um, because I think you've actually spoken to a number of the questions, particularly, I'll take the easy one. Jerry um, wanted to know, he said he paid $20 for a Met Opera single performer concert. And are you doing that? And I think Jerry, unless there was more, they, I think Lindsay spoke to that, yeah. I think the other question, and not to get away from uh, where you just were, because I'd love to to think more about how the theater is, the theaters are grappling with racism as well as nobody in the audience. I mean, um, somebody want there's a couple of questions from Robert Friedman and about, so how did you manage to keep paying people, keep people on staff uh, did you get the federal grant money? Did you qualify for like the PPP or, or is that all part of your way well, of staying alive? Let me, let me jump in. There's a, there's a multitude of income streams when you're running a not-for-profit theater company uh, divided essentially between earned income and contributed income. Earned income would be ticket sales, renting theater space or any space that you have uh, selling concessions, ticket fees on top of uh, the strict purchase price and a few other miscellaneous income streams and then contributed income. Contributed for an institution of my size, contributed income makes uh, probably about 75% of our operating budget each year. Wow. M much of that 75% is in the form of foundation support. Those foundations have assets in the hundreds of millions of dollars and they make multi-year grants. So I would say probably a third to half of our uh, donor foundation relationships are multi-year grants that we are in the middle of. Those foundation reached out to us quite quickly and said, we are not, we will be distributing money according to the contract. In fact, some of us, some of those foundations were looking at uh, diving a little deeper into the process and trying to award additional money to support uh, the theater and its operations and to keep us afloat. There was also um, a collaboration of a multitude of New York centric uh, culture support foundations and they created something called the New York City Impact Fund uh, for small institutional theaters that had been affected. We got funding from that. 
we got funding from the federal program, the PPP loan, uh, that will hopefully be entirely forgiven once we get to the end of the 24-week period it applies to. Um, and then there's donations from individuals. Much of our individual donor base dried up, and much of our uh, our board members' ability to make uh, gifts as they customarily would around our gala, which ended up being canceled in May, uh, has dried up as well. Those the the folks with leaner asset pools have uh, held on to the funding that they have, and it's the foundations that are actually keeping us afloat right now. We were very very lucky to have received uh, a couple of new big grants last year that are multi-year grants that came in that sort of um, uh, buttress our cash flow. But the, the majority of our um, pay structure and our staffing needs are covered by these foundation grants that make up you know, 60% of the 75% that is contributed income for the institution. A lot of other institutions don't, and, and and let me be even more blunt. Uh, and this is this is the thing that has shocked me about not-for-profit theater since I entered the sector. We probably make about six to seven percent of our annual income on ticket sales. Huh. Ninety-three or ninety-four percent of operations come from donors, uh, come from foundation donors, come from our annual gala. So the 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 job description. If I had to sum up my job description. Keep us from going bankrupt, raise $2 million a year. That's the job. And that, that job involves uh, connecting in a major way with donors from across the spectrum. Because again, the majority of our income uh, is achieved via those gifts. Many of the larger institutions like Lindsay's has a, an enormous education program, a very well-funded enormous education program and other programs like it. And she runs three theaters the smallest of which is 50 seats bigger than my one theater. So <laughs> earned income for an institution like Manhattan Theater Club plays 60%. a plays 60%. 6% for me, 60% for her. So part of the dialogue that has really happened when we were, uh, when, when we start talking about how do we engage with new audiences and how do we bring in folks to the theater, for my institution, it's easy. My my, you know, face ticket price is about sixty bucks, but I probably average about twenty dollars per ticket sold, uh, because we do steep discounts, and frankly, we give away thousands of tickets to each show because part of the mission is to make sure that people are seeing plays and musicals that are written and directed by women. And the way we do that, the way that we make it accessible, is by reaching out to schools, both colleges and high schools, and saying. We will give you 50 tickets if your students want to come see this work. This is how you begin to brew the process in the mind of uh, that younger generation of, oh, if I want to write plays, there's a place that might, might actually produce it for me. Uh, I'm not excluded from that equation. So part of my structure at WP Theater is minimizing, I mean, it's not intentional. I promise you it's not intentional. Minimizing our earned income, that helps us actually generate a lot of contributed income. Got it. Uh, that, that model is prevalent amongst most of the smaller theaters uh, in New York City. Is the, the 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 math works out that more of the money comes as contributed than earned. So I have Lindsay. Before you touch that, I have two more questions that I want to get in before you, and you can split them up. One is, and this may be a very short one. Um, did you guys provide any income stream to the? Um, the freelancers, creative freelancers, or is, was there anything that could be done for actors, directors, um, or pay out some contracts? I mean, that's so we um, not I, a short answer. Well, no, but, but <laughs> I, I will do my best to keep it short because I also see the clock. I, the, the previous question, I mean, I think my answer is similar enough to Michael's that I don't really need to repeat that um but uh you know we also we did get a ppp loan you know there are lots of things like that which help to keep us afloat um we did because um of i think the the great leadership um at our company we were able to we didn't furlough anybody until after june 28th which was the end of our fiscal year um 
the the leaders you know they didn't know when they made the decision that the ppp would come through but um i guess we do have enough in the bank that we knew it would be okay um and so we were able to keep on you know every last assistant and intern through the end of june um which we feel really proud about um unfortunately you know it did not extend to all the freelance artists that being said i will say when we you know um i talked a little bit earlier about closing shows without any notice um but even though we did that you know we had an off-broadway play by richard greenberg running um we went to the theater that thursday night and we said you guys broadway is shutting down you can perform tonight and have it be our swan song or you do not have to go on the stage if you feel unsafe and the company decided to perform and the next day we were having a meeting about how to uh you know compensate these actors because the show was now closed we're typically required to give them two weeks notice um before we close a show that's specific to my company um and we decided to pay out the full two weeks to these actors anyway because our general manager at the time and I quote, we've got the money now, so we should give it to the actors while we still can. Um, and I'm so glad that we made that choice. And we did the same thing for our other shows that were, you know, running. Um, even before I alluded to deals that we made with various unions, um, even before we had those terms, we really tried to do right by the artists. But, you know, I could not, the shows that, we had to cancel that didn't even make it into rehearsal. We simply didn't have the money to pay out those contracts um, without any sort of income stream um, that just became impossible. Um, but the PPP helped us take care of um, the administrative staff. Um, and, and I guess certain artists' salaries could be covered by that. Um, so what was the other part of the question? The other, the other part, actually, or the next question, is looking forward. So, oh, right. what have you got? Do you have like plays lined up? Is if if tomorrow, by magic, the world said, you know, we we know how to do this and it's safe and we can go back thirty days from now. So, do you do you keep things online? Do you, you know, are you, you know, I know companies that have, that have, you know, sort of run down, but they can start up very quickly because yeah. what, what is it like in the theater? So it's sort of yes and sort of no. I'll, I'll answer quickly and then you can have a turn. Um, the play that we were meant to do last spring, which got canceled, we are intending um, to do when we reopen. Um, we don't have firm dates on that yet. So the company's like aware, but I mean, frankly, we have no contracts with any of those people, but we're just not afraid that they're going and getting other work somewhere else right now because it's not like MTC is shut down, but everyone else can be doing their thing. Nobody's, um, doing, nobody's doing anything. Right. We are, you know, every shit show that we postponed in the spring and then in the fall, Part of my job was to, you know, we make a deal with the playwright that says we have the rights to the play for, let's call it a year. But now that year is going to be up before we know it. So I have to reach out to the agents of the playwrights and try to get that extended for another year, maybe sometimes two years. Um, in addition to simply that, um, you know, again, going back into the, the conversation about the racism in our theater, we've also need to, you know, if we reopened with the second half of the season that we had planned, right. it would be completely tone deaf and not responsive to this moment and this real revolution that I think is happening in the theater industry. Um, so the people who choose the plays at MTC have really been doing ter tremendous work to try to figure out um, you know, what the right play, is. like what will people want to see after a pandemic? And, you know, how do we make it? So uh, we've got a lot of artists of color in the room, um, you know, all these various kinds of uh, conversations are taking place. And when they decide what they're going to want to do, I have to go and 
hope that we can get the rights to those plays. And then we will start to slowly build, you know, the teams who will make those plays. But it surely it's really, uh, we don't know because we could go down this road again and then I could, I could have to make the phone calls that make me so sad about needing to postpone the production. You know, we're really trying to ride the line of making sure we're ready with something when the time comes, but also not getting too far ahead of ourselves that we've got to roll it back again. What about you guys? I mean, echoing what Lindsay said, it really would be uh, plan planning out a show is a multi-month endeavor. However, if I got a phone call that said you can make a show happen in your theater in a month, I would book we a would show into my out. theater in a month. <laughs> I would begin hiring people and I would know that if I hire those people but have to cancel later on, I'm still paying out all of them and that would be okay. The, there is a, a, a great, enormous sense of desperation uh, across the theatrical landscape about being able to make art again. Uh, and and one of the big components of that is being able to pay artists. Um, I, you know, I described how 75% of my income is contributed income. The artists have nothing to rely on, nothing to fall back upon, uh, and are essentially beholden to the institutions to stabilize and create a path forward and then begin to employ them again. Um, I, I, I like to think most of my friends uh, in, that are artists in this world have been able to take advantage of the additional $600 that the government was paying for unemployment. This is the last week of it. And after this moment, I have a real, real deep seated fear for what's gonna happen to many of my artist friends, certainly those of a younger generation who are looking, who have you know struggled to move to New York City, make a deposit on an apartment, which is often a lot of money, and now have pulled up their, their roots and said, I better head home. I don't know how long this is gonna last. And I, in, a, in a real certain, in a real you know, matter of days, maybe week, have no, uh, ha won't have that extra $600, which is allowing them to pay their bills. Uh, and while, you know, my, my $100 million um, foundations that are funding much of New York City cultural uh, are are still able to give money because the stock market is okay. Folks that aren't don't have uh, an enormous volume of assets invested for growth uh, are are really left out. One of the big conversations that we've been having institutionally, and I, I made this sort of bold statement. And, and keep my, I'm I'm the person who controls the purse strings at my institution. But at a staff meeting we had last week, I said, you know, we haven't paid an artist in ten weeks. And that has to change within two weeks. Bring me your ideas. We need to pay the artist something. I, I don't care who it is or how it is, but we have to start engaging them and make sure that we're not just for in, an entire year or some enormous chunk of time only paying the staff of this institution. We are here and exist to serve the artists. And if we can't get the money into their hands, even under the premise of, you know, make anything, literally make anything and we'll send you a thousand dollars, then we really won't be here for very long. When we get to the other side of this, I just feel like there's a lot of our artistic communities that's going to look us right in the face and say, where the heck were you? Yeah. As we were floundering and desperate, absolutely desperate. You guys were nowhere and every, and congratulations, everybody got paid at your institution for a whole year except not one single artist was compensated. So we're, in addition to uh, the two very major issues, it's becoming really clear as the conversation extends into uh, January, March, June, and September of next year, the conversation is becoming really pointed about how, how can we get, how can we divert some of the funds that we have into the hands of the artists who are struggling? And there are ways, the Actors Fund is providing relief there are, there are places that are providing support, but I don't know that they're enough. I actually haven't even asked the question of my artistic community, how are you paying your bills right now? What's the next, what, is, what does this look like next for you? What I'm doing is actively reaching out to senators that cover the theater district and saying, you must fight in the, for government funding. You have to get support for cultural institutions because the artists who make up the lifeblood are, are going away. They're deciding to do other things with their lives. And if everybody becomes, no offense, I'm gonna say something offensive. 
if everybody becomes an insurance agent, the <laughs> artistic community has lost a major foothold. And if it becomes a generational thing, like literally art could skip a generation because for an entire year, nobody could make money and they all took other jobs. You're really struggling to make up ground and you've really let some important voices go by the wayside, uh, which I find unacceptable. So even at the expense of some sort of institutional protection, what we're saying out loud and as many times as possible is, what are you doing for your artistic community right now? How are you filtering? How are you getting money into their hands? Uh, and it's hard. You just got a bravo, Michael. I saw. Thank you. I guess on that note, we're going to end. And it is a hard note. And um, I would hate to see a, uh, a generation disappear. So thank you. Michael and Lindsay. This, <laughs> it was a moment when I thought, oh, let's get the family on together. And you guys were awesome. So let's applaud them. Yay. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Make donations to your favorite theater <laughs> or any other arts organization that's shut down right now. Um, honestly, you know, 20 bucks makes a difference. Yep. And so that's my organization. We, no, definitely mine. Definitely <laughs> my organization. Buy All right. artist. Buy, you know, buy a piece of, buy something. Buy a piece of art. Now is the time. Thank you, guys. <laughs>